Thank you, ladies. Welcome this morning. I'm so glad that you're here. You didn't let this rain keep you at home. Um, I'm going to start this morning by asking you a question. Do you know why Formula 409, the cleaning spray, is called Formula 409? Well, it was given this name because of the tenacity of two young Detroit scientists who experienced 408 failed attempts before they finally succeeded with batch 409 and invented what they thought was the greatest cleaner of all times. Edmund McElhaney owned a sugar plantation in Louisiana before the Civil War. When the Civil War broke out and Yankee troops invaded his area in 1863, he fled. When he returned three years later, he found his plantation in ruins. He fell into depression and deep despair. Surveying his once prosperous plantation, the only thing that he could find that was still intact was a little plot of hot peppers off in the corner of one of his gardens. And so he took those hot peppers and he made a sauce out of them, hoping to spice up the meager dinners that he was able to pull together. And Tabasco sauce was invented. 150 years later, the McElhaney family still produces it. So let me ask you this morning, what about your past still plagues your present and hinders your future? If you could live your life over again, what about your past would you change? Would you like to go back and make something right with an old friend, maybe a family member? Have another chance to deal with that problem or failure which still plagues you with guilt today? And what about your present hinders your future? What do you wish was different about your circumstances right now? Where is life disappointing you today? And in what ways are things not working out as you dreamed that they would? Are your children worrying you? You know, it's been said that we're only as happy as our least happy child. Is your marriage not what you dreamed that it would be? How would you change your job if you could? Your finances? Your health? And where is God in all of this? You know, in his word, he promises in Jeremiah 29, 11, that he has plans to prosper us and not to harm us, plans to give us hope in the future, and we know that the sovereign, omnipotent Lord of the universe is our Father, and so is his children. We expect it better. If Bill Gates was your father, you'd assume a certain standard of living. If your dad was Jack Nicholas, you'd expect a certain advantage in the game. And you'd be right, but not in the way that you might expect. Revelation has a lot to say about this, and I think you might just be surprised what it does say. Philadelphia was the youngest town of all the seven churches, cities in Revelation. It was located 28 miles southeast of Sardis. Remember, we're traveling in a circuit as we visit these churches. It was founded in 140 BC by Attalus II, who so admired his brother Eumenus that he actually named his city One Who Loves His Brother. Now, the Christians living in Philadelphia must have thought that name a cruel joke. Let's see what Jesus wrote to the church here. Take out your Bibles if you have them with you. I hope you do. And we're going to be looking at the third chapter of Revelation today. But we're going to start with verse 7. So Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write the words of the Holy One the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. 
Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, some cities have slogans or reputations. You probably heard that New York City is referred to as a city that never sleeps. Of course, Chicago is the windy city. Well, in the first century, Philadelphia was known as the city of the open door. She was situated on one of the great highways of the world, leading from the west to the orient, and she was placed on the eastern edge of the Greek civilization and was intended to be an open door for the export of the Greek language and the Greek culture to the rest of their world. But things hadn't worked out the way that she planned. You see, the Phrygians to the east refused the Greek culture and her ways, and the open door that the Greeks intended was never successful. But Jesus says that his tiny church would do what the mighty Greek empire could not. Look at verse 8. It says, Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. Things are not what they seem. That's what Jesus said. But it's certainly not what their past or their present would indicate. Our text tells us that this church had little micro in the Greek power. They were small in numbers, probably no more than just a handful of believers. They were small in resources, for it was difficult for the Christians to find any work at all in the city of Philadelphia. They were small in stature or significance. Many of them were slaves, street people, just outcasts. They had no standing in their community whatsoever. Their present circumstances made any future significance impossible, or so they thought. Verse 9 tells us they were oppressed by those in the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie. You see, the Jews in the city of Philadelphia were happy to turn in the Christians living in their neighborhood to the Roman authorities. In return, the Jews were paid 10% of all the goods confiscated from the Christians. Every neighbor was a threat to a Christian's future. Those reading this letter must have wondered at Jesus' providence and plans for them. No believers in the entire book of Revelation were more hindered by their past and present from a glorious future of significance and joy. But in verse 11, we are told that if they would hold fast what you have, a remarkable future is indeed on the way. Jesus says that they would be a pillar in the temple of my God. Let me explain. Philadelphia was filled with so many altars and statues that the people in the first century referred to it as little Athens. And earthquakes were so common in the region that at the first tremor, the people fled from the temples, fearful that these, mil of these marble pillars would collapse on them and they would be crushed to death. But now by contrast, Jesus' people would be such a pillar in his eternal temple that never shall he go out of it. And he would write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God and my own new name. You see, whenever a leading citizen in Philadelphia did something noteworthy for the town, another marble pillar was erected and his name was engraved upon it. Those pillars are just rubble today. But the name of God inscribed on our hearts and souls will endure forever. 
The Christians of Philadelphia were exhorted by Jesus to look from their frustrated circumstances to their glorious Father, to look up rather than down, to look out rather than in, to look to God's future rather than to their past or to their present. And this letter is in the, Bib in the Bible so that today we can do this exact same thing. But it's not always easy to do that, is it? How can God redeem your child's death or your divorce? How can he be at work in the discouragements and setbacks which have wounded your soul? How can an all-powerful, all-loving God allow you to be trapped in Philadelphia? How are you supposed to trust God's heart when you can't see his hand? I've wrestled with these questions a great deal over the years. But I've come to some conclusions. First, not everything that happens expresses the perfect will of God. Second Peter 3.9 seems clear. God is not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Yet many perish, and many did not come to repentance. First Timothy 2.4 adds that God wants all people to be saved, and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Yet many are not saved, and many do not come to a knowledge of the truth. So why is this? Well, God made us to worship him. But you see, worship requires freedom. And so God has chosen to honor the freedom that he has given to us. Now, this is no denial or depreciation of his omnipotence or sovereignty. He has chosen to limit himself at the point of our freedom. When we misuse our freedom, the fault isn't his. We've stepped from his perfect will into his permissive will. Tragically, this is a common experience for us all. Second, when God's perfect will includes suffering and judgment, then he tells us. There are times in the Bible when God does cause difficulty and pain for people, but he always tells us why. He brought the plagues against Egypt, but only after warning Pharaoh of the judgment to come. He brought Babylon to enslave the Jews for 70 years, but only after warning of them to repent of their sins and the judgment to follow if they did not. I've concluded that if God causes suffering in life, if pain is a part of his perfect will, then he'll make sure that I know it and the reasons for it. If I suddenly confined one of my sons to his bedroom when he was young, without any explanation whatsoever, leaving him to figure out what he had done wrong, then I've not been a very good mother. When God brings hardship, it's always for a larger purpose, every single time. And third, God's holiness causes him to redeem all that he permits. Everything that happens must come from God's perfect will or from his permissive will. He must at least permit all that happens or he is not God. But he's holy and just in all his ways. Psalms 9-8 promises that God will judge the world in righteousness and govern the people with justice. He is perfect in every way. And so his holy nature leads him to redeem all that he will permit. If he will not use bad for a greater good, if he will not redeem suffering for a greater purpose, he violates his own character. But if we are submitted to his will, then we will join in the blessing which comes from his redemptive work. Joseph got to see the ways that God redeemed his suffering at the hands of his brother. Paul saw the salvation of the Philippian jailer who imprisoned him. And our very own John met Jesus in his cave on Patmos. But if we refuse his will, if we miss the ways, we will miss out on the ways that he redeems bad for good. Pharaoh certainly never saw the promised land. Many of the Jews perished in the Babylonian captivity. And according to tradition, Pilate committed suicide before ever trusting the risen Christ, whose atoning death he arranged. So when we are in Philadelphia, 
when we have micro strength and when our past and our present seems to stifle our future, we can know with certainty that that is not the case. We know that so long as we are yielded to the Spirit of God, the open door that he has sent before us can never be closed. So long as we trust him to redeem all that he permits, he will in ways that we will see now and in ways that we will not see until eternity is ours. Beethoven lost his hearing in the music world, thought that his genius was at an end, but he later composed some of his best works. Louis Pasteur made his greatest discoveries after suffering a stroke that threatened his life. John Milton's best poetry came after he lost his eyesight. And William Cowper wrote his greatest hymns between periods of insanity. The lowest valleys became the highest mountains. Bad became good. Charles Darrow, in the depths of the Great Depression, found himself out of work and out of money. He was an engineer with years of experience, but no job. He and his family were barely surviving. One evening, they made up a little game to try to take their mind off of their troubles. And so on a piece of cardboard, they drew a circle. And remembering a fun trip that the family had had to Atlantic City, they marked that circle with the names of its streets. Charles carved little houses and hotels out of pieces of wood, and they called their game Monopoly. They sold their game in 1935 and became millionaires. Bad became good. God's holiness causes him to redeem whatever he permits. When you're in Philadelphia, never give up. Never give in. Give yesterday to his forgiving grace. Get on your knees and do this. Then give today to his redeeming power. Ask him to use your present for his future. You have not because you ask not. And prayer positions you to receive all that God wants to give. Stay faithful to the last word that you've heard from God while open to the next. Remember that success is obedience and rejoice that the door God opens for you. No one can ever shut. Not now. Not ever. Giant pillars framed the door to the church in Philadelphia. They're all that stands of any of, of these churches in Revelation. The only visible remains of any of these seven congregations. Isn't that amazing? In the smallest church, the greatest doors. And God is still using the faithful church that I, they welcomed. Here's how I know that this is true. A friend of mine visited the site of the Philadelphia church and there he was greeted by a Muslim government worker who was employed as a caretaker of this archaeologic site. This worker gave him the only Christian literature that he saw anywhere during his time in Turkey. It was an extensive booklet on the seven churches of Revelation. This book had actually been written as an evangelistic witness, although I'm certain the caretaker wasn't aware of this. This brochure was available in three different languages, but only here, at this little church in Philadelphia. This Muslim man distributes hundreds a year without fully understanding its content. These booklets clearly outline God's plan of salvation and are one of the few evangelical witnesses in this part of the country. You see, even today, God is still using his church of the open door, and every Christian like her. So if you're in Philadelphia, know that today is a day to rejoice. God redeems all that he permits. Your door is open, and the best is yet to be. This is the promise of God. Laodicea stood 43 miles southeast of Philadelphia, on the Lycus River at the border of Phrygia, six miles south of Peropolis, and 10 miles from Colossae. The city occupied almost a square plateau several hundred feet high with mountains to the south rising more than 8,000 feet. 
The city was found in the, the mid third century BC by Antiochus II, who actually named this city after his wife, Laodice, which means justice of the people. The enormous wealth of Laodicea was derived in large measure from her location. She stood at the intersection of two great trade routes, one that went from Ephesus to the east and the other that went south from Pergamum out to the Mediterranean Sea. Laodicea was the site of large manufacturing and banking operations and was known particularly for the fine woolen carpets and clothing that she manufactured. The city served as the center for the worship of Aesculapius, the Greek god of medicine, and was the seat of a medical school. Cicero lived here in Laodicea, and many of his letters were written at the provincial court located in this city. Let's look at what Jesus wrote to the church here in Laodicea. Look at Revelation 3. We're going to begin with verse 14 where we left off. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You were neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you were lukewarm, I will, and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This city's great material success didn't translate into any spiritual significance. In fact, Laodicea is the only church in the book of Revelation to receive no praise whatsoever from Jesus. Let's see why that was the case and how this same problem can exist in our spiritual lives. And let's do this by asking ourselves three questions this morning. First, is my faith routine? Jesus says in verse 15, I know your works. You were neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold. Or hot. So why does Jesus use this particular metaphor for their souls? We well, see Laodicea had every natural resource except one, and that natural resource was water. The city's location had been determined by the road system, not by the water sources. And so water had to be transported into Laodicea through stone pipes that were three feet in diameter. This aqueduct is an engineering marvel, and parts of it still exist today. But the water that it supplied? Well, it was only adequate at best. Pipes were laid to two sources. Each of these sources was six miles from Laodicea. One was located to the south at Den Isley. The water source was fed by the snows that came off those mountains located there. And they started their journey to Laodicea at near freezing temperatures. By the time they traveled the six miles through those sun-warmed stone pipes, the water had become lukewarm. The other source was the hot springs no located north at Heropolis. The springs which arose from this city flowed across a wide plateau before spilling over a broad cliff that was 300 feet in height and a mile long. At its source in Heropolis, this water is at near boiling temperature. If you go there today, you see steam rising from this hot springs. But by the time it traveled the six miles to Laodicea, it too was lukewarm. And so the people of Laodicea, they knew all about lukewarm water. Unfortunately, their souls had come to the same state. Their worship had become boring, routine comfortable. The newness of their faith had worn off in the 40 years since this church was founded. 
They'd lost their joy, their zeal, their passion, and their hearts were as lukewarm as the water they were drinking. So let me ask you this morning, when was the last time you were excited about coming to church to worship Jesus? When was the last time you were overjoyed to read God's word or thrilled to spend time alone with your father in prayer? Do you share your faith with zeal? Do you give your money to God gratefully? If your faith is lukewarm, it's certain that Jesus is standing outside your life today and he continues knocking to get your attention. Second in myself, sufficient. Prime land contributed to Laodicea's wealth. The fertile ground of the Lycus Valley provided for great agricultural prosperity. The sheep that were bred in this region were noted worldwide for their fine, glossy, thick black wool. In fact, clothing from Laodicea was even mentioned in an edict by Emperor Diocletian. The city's location brought trade from across the world to her merchants. Her bank was famous across the ancient world. In fact, Cicero wrote of cashing his treasury bills in Laodicea. While most cities in the first century had one theater, Laodicea possessed two. But the most striking proof of Laodicea's wealth occurred in AD 60 when an earthquake devastated this region. Without any disaster relief whatsoever from Rome, this opulent city was rebuilt quickly by the people who lived there. Tacitus, the most famous of the ancient historians, pays tribute to their wealth when he writes, Laodice arose from the ruins by the strength of her own resources and with no help from us. Yet against the backdrop of such affluence, Jesus says to his church there, verse 17, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. They thought that their future was secure and their resources sufficient for any crisis. But self-reliant people are always wrong. Circumstances eventually will force us to recognize that we each need the protection and the power that only Jesus can provide. Today, the formerly beautiful Laodicea lies mostly in ruins, mostly unexcavated. A large mound of dirt covers the place where this proud city once stood. The Christians in their city were self-sufficient until they were gone. In the same way, it's easy for prosperous Christians today to become self-sufficient, blind to our need for Jesus. And as a result, we come, become lukewarm in our faith and we lose all passion for our Lord. Jim Simbala is the pastor of the world-famous Brooklyn Tabernacle Church. But 30 years ago, it wasn't that way at all. Just a handful of believers on Wednesday evening prayer service, not many more in the Sunday worship service, their building was falling apart and their future with it. In desperation, the church began calling on God and seeking the fullness of his spirit in power and joy. And God has done a mighty work within them. Today, they have over 10,000 members and more than 10,000 attend that midweek prayer service. God is very real in their lives and in their worship. Jim Dennison shared that when he was the pastor of the Second Ponce de Leon Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, one of the wealthiest churches in the South, he had an opportunity to visit Simbal in his office in Brooklyn. Here's what Dennison wrote of that experience. By contrast to my church, I found myself on a campus with security cameras everywhere and two full-time bodyguards. I was taken aback by the poverty and difficulty faced by most of the church's members. And I asked Jim how they were able to do church in such a difficult place. Simbala only smiled and replied, I don't see how you are able to do church in such a difficult place. You see here, we know we need God. How many of your members can say the same? Any Christian can be in Laodicea but material prosperity makes this condition even more likely. The affluence of our western suburbs makes us prime targets for such self-sufficiency. 
So be aware of this. Be on the lookout in your own spiritual life. And then third, am I spiritually satisfied? The Laodicean Christians were satisfied with their material wealth and lifestyles. Jesus had to shout to them from behind their locked hearts. You are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Their spiritual condition was truly ironic. The Laodiceans possessed the greatest bank in the region, yet they were poor. The Greek word that's used here means to be as destitute as a beggar. Their city was known for a ISAV that was known as Calyrian, yet the people were blind. They were known for the wool that they produced, and yet their souls were naked. They were satisfied with their spiritual lives, and they didn't realize how wretched and pitiable they were. Whenever we're comfortable with our spiritual lives and our progress, then we're in Laodicea. Are you happy with the state of your soul today? Several years ago, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, experienced a period of explosive growth. A new nuclear power plant was being built in the area and people were moving in from everywhere. Once the rental homes and apartments were filled up, people began living in trailer homes and finally in tents. The members of a local church were afraid that so many of these newcomers would come and join their church that they would take it over. And so the church members passed a resolution that in order to become a member of their church, you had to own property in the county. And their strategy worked. But over time, the church got smaller and smaller until it finally died. A businessman came in and he bought the property and he turned it into a barbecue restaurant called the Parsons Table. Now when you go in there, nobody asks you if you own property in the county. They only did that when it was a church. When Jesus is alive and well in our spirit, he creates a hunger in us for God. We have a deep yearning to know him better, to be more like him, to serve him more effectively. Jesus defeats spiritual routine and self-sufficiency and self-satisfaction. But only he can. And so Jesus must knock persistently on the locked doors of their hearts and souls. And here's his answer to their spiritual malaise. Verse 19, to those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. You see, they're still loved by their Lord, but how do they, how do they return to him? How, how do we? Well, first, we must seek God with passion. Jesus says to the lukewarm Laodiceans, verse 19, be zealous. The words in Greek mean be earnest, excited, passionate. This is a command, not an option, and it's in the present tense. It should be translated, be continuously passionate. You see, passion is the cure for a lukewarm spirit. Drive, energy, and devotion should characterize our quest to know God. But I want you to notice that passion is a decision before it becomes an emotion. The feeling follows the action. We must choose to seek God earnestly. Choose to read scripture avidly. Choose to pray without ceasing. To worship God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. Choose to replace our staid religion with a personal relationship. And in doing so, we will open the door to the very one we seek. And then second, we must pay the spiritual price. Jesus continues, so be zealous and repent. He calls Laodicean Christians to admit our sins and failures and reject them, to turn from them once and for all. He knows the more that our passion for him grows, the more we will reject sin and temptation. A spiritual inventory is never more essential than when we find ourselves in Laodicea. And then third, welcome the Savior. When we return to our passion for Jesus and repent of our lukewarm hearts, Jesus will come through the door that we open to him. He guarantees it. Verse 20, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. 
In Jesus' day, dinner was a long meal and a time for fellowship. Jesus promises a time of personal fellowship and a relationship with anyone who truly desires it. And we will be in this relationship forever. Verse 21, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. We will share in the feast of the Messiah for all eternity as we rule with him. Oswald Chambers, one of the greatest theologians of all time, once observed, the surest sign that God has done a work of grace in my heart is that I love Jesus best, not weakly and faintly, not intellectually, but passionately, personally, devotedly, overwhelming every other love of my life. Is this where you are? Is this where you would choose to go today? In 1853, the English artist Holman Hunt painted a portrait of Jesus standing at the door and knocking. I think we have a photograph of it. There we go. He called it the light of the world. I know I've shown this to you before, but I had to show it again this morning because Hunt said that it's a visual representation of our text today. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. Fifty years after painting it, Hunt said it was more than a painting. It was a prompting, a divine command. One fascinating feature of the painting is that the door has no handle on the outside. It was left off intentionally. Why? Well, because the door to the heart is opened only from the inside. God enters by invitation only. One day, a small little girl stood before this painting, which is located in the chapel at Keeble College in Oxford, her hand in her father's. Finally, she turned to him and said, Daddy, did he ever get in? Jesus is still knocking at the door of our hearts. What is your answer today? Would you pray with me? Our dear Heavenly Father, you are the Almighty, the Pantocrator, the Living One. You hold the keys to death and Hades. And we stand before you this morning in awe. And we worship you and we love you. But it's, you loved us before we ever loved you with a love so great that you sent your Son to die for us. And we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for these letters to the churches. They're letters of encouragement, but they're also letters of warning to us. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that you would help each one of us to search our hearts and souls and look for any lukewarm water that may be coursing through our veins. And, Lord, if we do find some, help us to address it immediately. Help us to cry out to you with, with passion and desire. Help us to remember that it's a, an action before it's a feeling, Lord, and that we have the power to turn this around. And so we thank you for the admonitions for this church in Laodicea. But Lord, we thank you for this little church in Philadelphia, that you've reassured us that when we feel we have little power, micro power, that we have great power because the Holy Spirit lives in our hearts and in our souls, and he gives us access to your power, Lord. Help us to always remember, no matter how bleak the days may seem, that all that you allow, you will redeem for your glory, Lord. I thank you for each woman that's here this morning and the families that they represent. I pray a special blessing on each one of them, and I pray a blessing on each small group that follows. We ask all these things in thy son's most precious name. Amen.